Okay, dear colleagues, welcome to our today event, which closes the short introductory section of the course. We will have two 30-minute lectures, followed by a 15-minute discussion. Uh, I ask you whether you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yes, okay, yes, thank you very much. Okay, okay. Yes. Uh, so you have the opportunity to interrupt me or ask in the chat, but while I make my presentation, I cannot see if somebody has questions in the chat because I cannot manage this. So uh, in this event, if it, somebody is important, please interrupt me. After my lecture, I will close my window of PowerPoint and then I will find your questions. So I... Share my screen. Can you see this, the role of ultrasound? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Yes, it's visible. So, uh, indeed, the, our two lectures today uh, serve both the theoretical foundation and are part of the most important team, the viewpoints and the management of nodular goiter. So, I only mention here that not only section 2 nodular goiter, but other sections, including the fifth one, the interventions, and the sixth advanced one, and the last supplementary section deal with nodular goiters. Instead of a long introduction, let's turn to the subject. During this lecture, I always notice which chapter deals in detail with the problem mentioned. So, while discussing the role of ultrasound in the evaluation of thyroid patients, we should never forget about the goal of the evaluation, which defines what to do. So, what are these goals of a suspected nodular goiter disease? The first task is to determine whether the patient has thyroid nodule or not. While answering this question, we rely almost exclusively on thyroid ultrasound. Except for very rare cases, the ultrasound defines the presence of thyroid nodule. Considering the absence of effective medication in the event of a thyroid nodule, the very relevant issue is whether to operate a patient or not, or whether to uh, suggest other non-surgical therapies. The last question relies on those patients who do not require surgery, we need to decide which patient should be monitored and how often this should be recommended. Let's roll the ultrasound in detail in these cases. The first problem is the most neglected issue in the thyroid literature. Most authors pretend that the problem of defining a nodule does not even exist. In fact, in the everyday practice, this is the least resolved problem with serious implications for the investigation procedure as a whole. If we read the only existing definition on thyroid nodules in the literature, we have got no help. Although the definition has been presented at least three times in 17 years, it has no practical value. If we took it seriously, all human beings would be a nodular goiter patient. So we always must judge on a discrete region whether this is a nodule or not. Considering the more than 90% uh, uh, presence of discrete lesions, the most important and most difficult to answer questions arises in Hashimoto's pyoviditis. Some considerations. Firstly, it is preferred using nodule in pathological sense and not using this term for all discrete echo abnormalities of Hashimoto's pyoviditis which may be either more active foci of thyroiditis or the opposite, the areas which are not influenced by thyroiditis. Both of those, these patients on the left and the right presented with the most common form of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Both the larger hypochic areas in the left and the smaller discrete lesions in the right case should be regarded as more active foci of the disease and not of pathological nodules. Second, it seems to be worth restricting the use of nodule for those lesions which are larger than 10 millimeter 
or larger than 5 mm in the event of any suspicious signs. Both of these patients presented with several discrete cystic areas. However, these patterns should not be regarded as abnormal. If we use the term nodule for these small cystic areas, we simply stigmatize the patient and cause unnecessary anxiety and unnecessary further examinations. Such lesions are best named as discrete areas of non-pathological size. These lesions indeed correspond to dilated macrofollicles, normal elements of all thyroid. Okay, the size is a bit larger in the left case, but these are surely uh, uh, macrofollicles. And turn to the rule of ultrasound de to determine which nodule to operate. There are three distinct reasons for thyroid surgery. There is a fourth one, the wish of the patient, but strictly speaking, this cannot be considered as a professional reason. The first is autonomously functioning thyroid adenoma, which causes hyperthyroidism. In this regard, the role of ultrasound is mainly the measurement of the nodule. Another important task is to examine the whole thyroid in order to decide whether surgery or radioiodine therapy would be the appropriate choice of definitive therapy. The left case is a typical presentation of an autonomous functioning adenoma causing hyperthyroidism. The upper image shows the adenoma. Because of the low TSH level, the contralateral lobe gets decreased in size. The situation is almost similar in the right patient. Almost. There is an adenoma marked with wide arrows in the ventral part of the right lobe, while the lower image shows the left lobe, which has decreased in size. This case illustrates the importance of ultrasound in seemingly simple cases. The patient had another nodule, dorsal to the autonomously functioning one. This nodule marked with red proved to be a papillary cancer. In connection with the second cause of surgery, ultrasound plays a much more important role. One of the most important messages of the whole course is the statement highlighted in red. A lot of seniors have learned that a nodule larger than a certain size, namely 3 cm, is synonymous with surgery. Since a significant proportion of teachers do not perform ultrasound themselves, this magic 3 cm as a surgical indication limit is often said even now. From 2023, we had another magical diameter, which is much better. The ETA suggests that nodules exceeding 4 cm should be operated on. However, it is clear that compression symptoms are caused not by a nodule, but the enlarged lobe. This is again a very simple finding, which is very often not taken into account by experienced endocrinologists either. It is not the size of a nodule, but the size of the nodular thyroid lobe that determines whether a goiter can cause compressor symptoms or not. Besides the volume of the nodule, there are two other factors which have crucial role. Higher the thyroid, larger the size causing compression. In those thyroids which are located lower, the chance causing compression is much higher. The other factor is the age of a patient. A 20-year-old woman with a 3 cm nodule is an absolutely different story compared to an 80-year-old patient with a similarly large 3 cm nodule. This patient had a large nodule that length exceeded 5 cm. Normally, such nodules require surgery. However, in this patient, the relatively large nodule caused only a minimal degree of enlargement. When the volume of the lobe of 12 mm is compared to the normal upper limit, we can see that the value is only slightly higher for a woman and normal for a man. The next rule of ultrasound is the establishing of substernal spread. Ultrasound is the tool which defines the presence and partly the degree of substernal spread. The demonstration or exclusion of substernal spread influences both the decision on surgery 
and the need for a preoperative neck and upper mediastinal CT scan. As a rule, neck and upper mediastinal CT scan should be performed if the lower pole of the thyroid cannot be visualized during swallowing. Here I play a video. The video shows how can we judge the spread to the chest. The longitudinal section of a large multinodular goiter is demonstrated. It means that the right side of the video shows the lower part of the thyroid. Examined with the neck head back in a supine position, the lower pole of the lobe is not visible. The critical point whether the lower pole becomes visible when swallowed. In this case, this happened. During swallowing, the lower pole of the lobe is signed with white arrows. Now the swallowing and the lower pole came into sight. Once more. So we can see why the patient swallowed the lower pole, which is signed with white arrows. It means that significant substernal spread was unlikely in this patient. Our approach is different for a nodule located in the isthmus. Because the space between the skin and the trachea is the narrowest here, a much smaller nodule can cause the patient's complaints compared to a nodule located in one or the other lobe. The case on the left shows this situation. The small nodule caused an uncomfortable feeling of pressure for the patient. A lesion of similar size in the case on the right did not cause any problems. Obviously, there is a significant difference in the perception of human beings. However, it is also worth seeing here that the patient on the left was much thinner, so the nodule reached pretty much the level of the skin, like in the case on the right was located almost one centimeter deep. So the distance here is only two millimeter and here around one centimeter. I asked the colleagues to mute themselves. Okay, I go further. Considering these circumstances, in many cases, it results in an awkward situation if the ultrasound examination is performed by someone, by the radiologist, other than who is saying the final word regarding the surgery. This is the clinician, mostly the endocrinologist. A well-organized and well-functioning collaboration between the radiologist and the clinician can, of course, reduce the difficulty but in my opinion, the ideal situation is when the clinician making the decision himself or herself performs the ultrasound examination that underlies the final decision on surgery. The third cause of surgery that is most commonly discussed in the literature is what guidelines would focus on, and this is malignancy or suspicion of malignancy. Let's see a bit simplified version of the algorithm published after 2006. There are slight differences between the guidelines, but the point in all cases is this. So if a nodule is suspected, ultrasound and TSH determination should be performed. The role of scintigraphy is mainly restricted for patients with low TSH level. In euthyroid and hypothyroid patients, and in those in whom thyroid autonomy was excluded, ultrasound determines what to do next. The indication of FNA depends on the size of the nodule and on the presence of suspicious ultrasound characteristics. Let's look at the critical point of the guidelines. The first is the suspicion of the nodule. In some ways, this is the very essence of the algorithm. The guidelines are the same, they include lesions which are palpable or suspicious on palpation being nodules and nodules found during other imaging procedures. No guideline considers ultrasound screening to be warranted. It means that neither US ultrasound screening nor the examination of thyroid during carotid Doppler examination is justified. Numerous studies have confirmed that the disadvantages of ultrasound screening clearly outweigh the benefits of screening. 
For those who are all new to this, I definitely recommend reading this medical study. The story is very instructive, but it is beyond the scope of this course to go into detail. The essence of the ultrasound screening is that this hurts the interest of both the screen population by overdiagnosis and overtreatment of thyroid nodules and hurts the interest of real thyroid patients because of the source depri resource depri deprivation. The magnitude of the problem spur has best illustrated by the fact that from 2005 till 2015, the, uh, the proportion of patients entering the thyroid outpatient department doubled. Uh, it means double those, uh, the proportion of those patients who were sent uh, because of screening. Going further in the algorithm, the next problem is the interpretation of the nodule. This has been already mentioned. The issue is that even a healthy thyroid inevitably has discrete lesions. The presence of tiny discrete lesions is not the exception, but the rule. Hashimoto is the real problem, as the most common ultrasound is the presence of discrete hypochloric lesions, which is found in more than 90% of patients. And now let's jump from the start to the end of the algorithm and the indication of FNE. All guidelines published after 26 rely on suspicious signs in nodules between 10 and 20 millimeter. Let's see these suspicious signs. I mentioned here that during the entire course, I rely on the guidelines of five professional societies. These are the common guidelines of American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and American College of Endocrinology, the American College of Radiology, the American Thyroid Association, European Thyroid Association, and the Korean Society of Thyroid Radiology. The discussion of these ultrasound features is the backbone of the next section, the nodular goiter. This time, I will not merge into the details, I only point out that features highlighted are considered as suspicious signs in all thyroids, either directly or indirectly. The echogenicity of the nodule is clearly the most important characteristics. Two societies make distinction between deep and non-deep hypogenicity. Those who make and list deep hypogenicity among suspicious characteristics. Those societies that do not discriminate hypogenic nodules according to the degree of hypogenicity take hypogenicity even more seriously. This is because it is a condition that in the presence of any other sign, the nodule is classified in the most suspicious category. Let's see some examples. The left upper nodule is darker than the strap muscle running ventral to the thyroid. Therefore, this is a deeply hypochloric lesion. The left lower nodule, lower nodule has some punctate echogenic foci, which are in this case microclassifications. The right upper nodule uh, presents taller than wide uh, shape because the depth exceeds the width. Moreover, it has also lobulated margins, so this presents two not two, but three suspicious signs because this, it is clearly uh, deeply hypochloric. Compare this echogenicity to the echogenicity of the strep muscle running ventral to the thyroid. The right lowest nodule, right lower nodule, shows also labulated margins. We will discuss the thyroids in many chapters later in the course. Here, I raise your attention to very important considerations. There are two forms of cysts in which we do not count with malignancy. These are the entirely spongiform or anechoic nodule. In all other nodules, the basis of our decision is the nodule echogenicity, which itself decides the classification in more than 95% of nodules. This is because less than 5% of non-hypopaic nodules present with suspicious signs. 
So undoubtedly, the echo density is the most important feature of a nodule. We should never forget about the fact that suspicious signs mean suspicious of papillary cancer. Because overwhelming majority of thyroid cancers are papillary tumors, therefore the features of papillary cancer determine what we think is a suspicious sign for all thyroid cancer. This proposal is a matter of concern in two cases. Both are cancers that do not or much less frequently through the suspicious signs on which newer systems are based on. These are follicular cancer and the follicular variant of papillary cancer. This is a very important figure from the work of Ye and co-workers. We can see that papillary and follicular cancer behave completely opposite for each and every suspicious characteristics. Note that the difference, it, it is not only of statistical value, comparing all values, the difference is of very practical relevance. The situation is almost similar if we compare the conventional form of papillary cancer with the follicular variant of papillary cancer. Except for the shape, these two variants behave again completely opposite. So what are the consequences? If we rely on suspicious characteristics of papillary cancer in indicating FNA, a significant proportion of follicular cancers and follicular variant of papillary cancers less than 2 cm in maximum diameter remains undiagnosed. This ratio can be even 50% in the event of follicular cancer. This concern affects all guidelines published after 2006 and all thyroid systems because they rely on suspicious findings of papillary cancer when indicating FNA. The details will be discussed in separate chapters of the course. Here I uh, wrote two uh, quite hard sentences from the work of Trimbury at co-workers. These are hard but well-established statements. Two clear questions inevitably arise from these clear statements. I think these conclusions call into questions all the guideline proposals and the practice based on them. I have to mention here that the ultrasound presentation of the third frequent subtype of thyroid cancers, the medullary cancer, is very close to that of papillary cancer. So the concern is the diagnosis of follicular cancer between 10, uh, 10 and 20 millimeter in maximal diameter. This table compares two approaches, those used before and after 2006. The only relevant difference affects nodules between 1 and 2 cm in maximal diameter. In this cohort of patients, we can see two important differences. There are significant proportion of cancers which will be missed if we apply recent suggestions. Up to 50% of follicular cancers can be missed. On the other hand, we can spare unnecessary FNA in 40% of benign nodules. I do not want to go into further details, only one single consideration. The significance of the failure of timely diagnosis in these two cancers is not yet clear. It is a guessing that there is a very low risk for patients remaining undiagnosed, but we, this is a belief on retrospective data, but we have no evidence of prospective ones. So after we finished the evaluation, we face with a disturbingly high ratio of patients with inconclusive FNA diagnosis. This 30% must be surely a lower estimate because in many publications, the non-diagnostic ratio alone is 30%. 
In this cohort of patients, the importance of molecular biological tests is emphasized in the guidelines. These studies surely can have important contribution in some cases, primarily in Bethesda 3 and TPO of unknown significance cases. However, this technique, the molecular biology, cannot overcome the failure of adequate sampling, and there is no difference in the molecular biological pattern between a follicular adenoma and the well differentiated follicular cancer. In my opinion and in my practice, a much cheaper and easy to perform approach, the reconsideration of ultrasound is the pivotal in making the right individual de decision. This is again one of the most important messages of the entire course. We must be prepared to reinvestigate the patient. The only way of avoiding this second ultrasound examination is the video archiving of all, all ultrasound examinations. It is worth realizing, according to most guidelines, ultrasound is only for diagnosing nodules and deciding which nodules should be undergo cytological examination. There is virtually no literature data on the possible role of ultrasound in deciding uncertain cases. We deal with this possible role in a separate chapter. Here I show only two cases. The evaluation of both patients resulted in Bethesda 4 in follicular tumor. Although microfollicular proliferation is the hallmark of cytological diagnosis of a follicular tumor, this pattern can be observed in practically all thyroid pathologies, naturally with a much lower frequency. However, around one-third to two-thirds of cytologically diagnosed follicular tumors prove not follicular tumors on histopathology. This situation is responsible for more than half of unnecessary surgeries. So the problem is not the distinction between follicular uh, adenoma and cancer, but that in the subgroup of Bethesda 4, uh, around up to 50% of cases proved to be not follicular tumors. So in this situation, the reconsideration of ultrasound can have a crucial role. By definition, a follicular tumor must be surrounded with a complete capsule, which ultrasound signs, the halo and perinodular blood flow can be found in more than 90% of, of cases. If we find one of these signs, as in the left patient, the chance of follicular tumor is very high, while if neither signs are present, as in the right case, the chance of a follicular tumor dramatically decreases, surely lower to 10%. The final goal of ultrasound is the follow-up of the patients who avoided surgery. The goals of the follow-up are very similar to that of the first examination, we should decide whether a patient has or has not to be operated on. In the event, hyperthyroidism, the TSH test is the pivotal, ultrasound has no role. In patients need to be referred for surgery during a checkup, the most common cause is an increase in the nodular lobe. The pivotal is the measurement of the nodule and the nodular lobe. If the three diameters of the nodules and also the lobes were not given at the first examination, the patient and the examining physician were deprived of the most or only important information at follow-up. Considering the degree of inter-observer variation, it would be desirable to perform the first and subsequent examination by the same physician. Except for cystic lesions, a benign nodule grows usually very slowly. Even in the case of a relatively fast-growing nodule, it takes several years for the rate of growth to exceed the intra-observer variation. So a check sooner than a year has very limited sense except for newly developed, uh, newly developed complaints. Uh, the new ETA guideline, the 2023 guideline, uh, presented a detailed uh, suggestion when uh, to repeat ultrasound and when to make a uh, check of the nodular goiter patients depending on the Bethesda uh, classification and depending on the thyroid classification. But in most cases, 
the usual uh, time of uh, re-evaluation is three to five years. The third reason for performing follow-up is the recognition of answers missed at the first examination. As a rule, we don't have to expect the benign module to get cancer rules, however, the FNA can fail. Nowadays, routine repetition of cytological examination is not recommended. However, the justification for this should be determined for each evaluation group based on the experience of the sampler and the cytologist. In the nodules showing suspicious sign, repeating the cytology once does seem rational, even for non-growing nodules. If a benign appearing nodule grows significantly, that is by more than 30% in volume, then repeat FNA can harm both the patient and the physician. Now we are at the end of the lecture. We demonstrated the role of ultrasound in all phases of evaluation of nodular goiter patient. Ultrasound is the only means of recogniz uh, recognizing the nodule. Its role is crucial in deciding whether to operate on a patient. And ultrasound is an essential tool for the subsequent screening of non-surgical nodular patient. Some take-home messages. The data clearly suggests that ultrasound screening has more harm than good to the screen persons and further examinations generated by screening clearly impairs real direct patients' access to care. The three diameters of not only the nodule but also of the lobe must be measured. This measurement is the basis not only for our current decision but for later examination we can use it to decide whether, for example, a recent neck complaint can be explained by an enlarged thyroid or not. And obviously, it also helps to determine if the nodule has grown. We need to be aware that when someone talks about suspicious signs of thyroid cancer, he or she is making it inaccurately. These signs are characteristic of papillary cancer, by follicular cancers presents not even one of these suspicious signs. If clinicians perform ultrasound themselves, the ultrasound gives us the opportunity to improve the quality of tailored decision in those significant proportion of patients in whom the FNA proved to be inconclusive. Finally, we are professionally and ethically responsible for the patient being examined not for complying with the guideline. This is especially in the case if the proposal of the guideline is questionable in some respects. And this is the indication of cytology in modules between 10 and 20 mm in maximal diameter. Thank you very much for your attention.